When it comes to making materials in Blender, there's some techniques that come in so handy, I use them in almost every project. Now occasionally these techniques will make it into my videos and I'll discuss them at length, but quite often there's techniques that I've either never talked about or I've just briefly brushed over. So I thought today I would sit down and talk about five or six of my favorite techniques for making better materials in Blender. So this first technique comes in really handy if you have a seamless texture on an object that's been duplicated lots of times and you start to notice the repetition in the pattern. For instance, if we duplicate this a few times, you can see this white mark and the notches on the wood are exactly the same. It obviously stands out as just being a duplicate. Now you could go in there, right, and you could uh, manually move the UVs for each one of these. But if you've got like a, a floorboard for a large room or something, that's gonna take a really long time. It's actually much easier to do it with nodes. All we have to do is find a way to offset the location values for each one of these individually. Luckily, there's a really easy way to do that. If we get an object info node, you can see that we've got this random output. What that does is assigns a different color. I know these look very similar, but it is a slightly different shade of color for each one of these planks. And if we get a combine XYZ node, what we can do is we can plug the random into the X and the Y, and this is just gonna move the X and Y location a random amount. So if we take a look at this material now, you can see there's a different offset for each one of these. These white marks are next to each other here, but they're not anywhere else. And what you can also do to that is you can add a math node in between either one of these numbers, which will allow you to just keep moving it around until you find something that you like. And you can duplicate this onto the other one and do the exact same thing. Now, I made a video about this before and I had a lot of people question about, okay, but what if you're using an array to make the copy? Or what if all of these, if I join these together, they're all one object? Well, obviously what happens is now, this is based on each object being different. So now if we take a look at this, they're all exactly the same. So what we need to do is find another way to make this random output. If we get a geometry node, this has an output called random per island. And if we link that up instead, it should be working again. And the way that this works basically is that each one of these pieces has its own UV island. And it's just gonna give each one of the UV islands their own random number. Now, another problem that we have when we have a repeating asset like this is that everything is the exact same color. If you had floorboards like this, especially if they were outside, there would probably be all sorts of slightly different colors. In fact, if you look at the HDRI in the background, some of these are light and some of these are dark, right? You can see the actual wood. They're not all the exact same color. There is a little bit of variation there. So we can use this random per island to add that variation in. If we add a mixed color node, and plug that in between the base color and the principal shader. Then add a color ramp to define the color and plug this in to B. And we can use the random per island as the factor. Now we can just set some colors for this. Something like this. And we can even change this to constant to get different effects. And then I'm gonna change the mix node to multiply. And you can change the amount with the factor. And you can see we just have a slight bit of variation in the colors of the wood. And you can play around with different modes on this, like ease, to get all sorts of different effects. I like to leave it on constant most of the time. When I'm making materials in Blender, often I find that I only want to isolate the top faces on an object. This comes in really handy if you're trying to make an object look like it's getting wet from the rain or it's covered in snow or it's got some dust on it. So let's take this eagle statue here and make it look like it's been sitting on a shelf for a while and it's collected a little bit of dust. So the first thing I need to do is make a dust material. I'm just gonna copy this principal node. I'm gonna use this kind of dull beige color. I'm gonna set the roughness really high and I'm gonna set the sheen all the way up. If we take a look at that, it looks kind of like this is completely covered in dust. And I'm just gonna mix these two materials together. We've got the original base shader, and we've got the dust. And if we take a look at this, it should look like the whole thing is really dusty. Now, obviously to make this look more realistic, dust tends to settle from the top, so we need to define the top faces. 
It's actually really easy to do in Blender. If we get a texture coordinate node, and we take a look at the normals, what you'll notice is that normals which face perfectly up are always blue. So if we can separate out this blue channel, we'll have a mask that will show us only the top faces. So if we get a separate color node, and we look at the blue output, you can see that's exactly what it does. So I'm going to take this output and I'm going to plug it in the factor. And now we have an eagle which is covered with dust, but only on the top. But we can take this even further. Let's say we add in a, uh, a color ramp. What we can do is we can increase or decrease the spread of the dust just by dragging these sliders along. We can also change the intensity by bringing this color white down a little bit. And finally, we can add in a mix color and something like a noise texture or a musgrave. Plug this in as the factor. Maybe put that through a color ramp too, just to crunch the values a little bit. Take a look at this. So now if we start increasing the scale on the noise, you'll see that it's actually affecting where the dust has been spread. We can put the roughness up and the detail up a little bit and you start getting this really nice effect. What you can also do is set this to constant, which will give you a really defined edge on where the dust is gonna be. Now, one thing about this is it's based on the orientation of the object. So if I rotate this, you'll see that the dust isn't actually changing. What we have to do is apply the rotation. And now you can see the dust is going on this top side instead, and it's been completely removed from these undersides. I've been relying on this technique really heavily for a recent project which needed a layer of snow added to hundreds of objects. You see, ASUS and Intel have sponsored this video, and they recently sent me the ASUS ProArt Studio Book 16 OLED laptop to see what it can do. I decided to throw a really complex piece of art at the laptop to put it through its paces, and it certainly hasn't disappointed. It comes with a powerful Intel Core i9 13980HX processor, an RTX 4070 GPU, 64 gigabytes of RAM, and eight terabytes of storage. So far, it's proving to be an ideal laptop for creative work. The 16 inch ASUS Lumina OLED display looks fantastic, and it works great with the included ASUS Pen 2.0, which can be used either on the touchscreen or the touchpad. I also really enjoy the ASUS Precision Dial, which can be used for loads of different applications in Blender, everything from changing colors to adjusting the level of zoom. The ASUS Dial can be customized on a program by program basis using the ASUS ProArt Creator Hub app. The Creator Hub app has a load of different options for customizing the laptop, monitoring its performance and calibrating it so you get the same experience across ASUS devices. This project has been really quite large scale and I'm impressed with how well the performance of the ProArt Studio Book 16 easily keeps up. I definitely recommend that you keep a lookout for that final video. Check the link in the description to find out more about this laptop and its Intel processor. This is probably gonna be my favorite technique of the video because this is something I tried to figure out a couple of years ago and I couldn't make it work. And finally, I had a eureka moment and I use this quite often now. So let's say that we have a texture which isn't seamless, like the one we used at the start of the video. Well, what's gonna happen there is if we offset this on the X axis by a random value, it's gonna give us complete gibberish. You can see here that the UV map covers exactly one quarter of this decal sheet. What would be nice is if we could make sure that these would all line up exactly with the numbers, but instead it's just offsetting by a completely random amount which means that it never perfectly lines up. It is actually quite easy to make sure that it does line up though. Since this is one quarter the size, we need to make sure that it only ever moves in one quarter increments. So what we can do is add a math node and plug it into here. And then I'm gonna find snap, which is there. And I'm gonna type in an increment of 0.25, which is one quarter. And now you can see that this has worked. Every time I make random copies here, we're gonna get different numbers and they're all gonna line up exactly. Basically what this does is we're taking the random number and let's say the random number comes out as 0.3. This is gonna snap it to only 0.25 increments. So it would round it down to the nearest 0.25 increment. 
So where would that come in handy? Well, let's say you're making an asset like a bookshelf and you don't want to obviously texture like dozens or maybe even a hundred different books, especially if it's just in the background. It would be nice if you could randomize the color and the title on the books. So if we make a copy of this, you can see that's exactly what happens. The only difference with this setup is that instead of splitting the uh, texture into four, this is split up exactly into tenths. So there's 10 different titles here. And the only difference that makes to the node setup is instead of using increments of 0.25, I have to use increments of 0.1, which is obviously a tenth of one because there's 10 different titles. Then all I'm doing is I'm using these titles as I'm using the alpha of this to mix between the, the base color and the title that's on the book. I'm using the random output, which gives us different colors for all the titles on the book. And I'm also using the random output to give us different colors for the books as well. This is obviously a really efficient way to make lots of different assets for something like a library. If you're making a huge library set, you would definitely need to use something like this to add all the different textures. And of course, you don't have to have the uh, texture shape just running left to right. You could also have it going up and down as well, and it would be picking horizontally and vertically. All you would have to do there is add another one in on the Y axis. Trying to make a complex series of blinking lights for something like a Ferris wheel or a jukebox can be really time consuming. Usually what you would have to do is manually keyframe all of the lights, or you can go into the shader nodes if you're really good at math and you can set things up with like a sine wave and kind of make a pattern like that. But that's also quite time consuming. There is actually a much easier way to do it. What I've done is I went into an image editor and I've just made this sheet of different patterns. I've overlaid, very roughly overlaid, the UVs here. And I've plugged this pattern into a multiply and that's controlling the strength. So the white parts on the image will have the most strength and the black parts will be off. So if you move this around, you can see that this actually animates the lights. I'm going to scale these down. I'm going to scale them on the medium points first, and I'm going to put them over the top here. And you can see that if we can animate these UVs, then it will create this really cool effect. Now, one thing you might notice about this is that some of the lights, if you move over to say here, some of the lights are half on and half off. The way that we can fix this quickly is to just go to something like individual origins, and scale all these UVs right down so they only occupy one pixel pretty much at a time. Now, if we animate these, you'll see that all of the lights are either on or they're off at various strengths. Right, same as if we move it over there. We get a really nice gradient. So how do we animate this so it will just continually go? Well, that's really easy. We just need to set up one keyframe. We can control this just with the uh, Y axis. So what I'm going to do Let's go to the start here and set this to zero at a keyframe. I'm going to move further along and set this to uh, not two. Add another keyframe. And that will continually move our UVs all of the time. We can press shift and E, go linear extrapolation, and that will just continue the same movement all the way through. Then if we want to change the speed, we just need to grab this keyframe here. So if we move them close together, the effect will be really fast. And if we move further away, the effect will obviously be really slow. We can also swap the order around. And now the light pattern will move in the opposite direction. Now this is a much quicker way of setting up systems like this. And if you start making more and more complex patterns, you can obviously make some really cool light effects. You don't have to just use this technique to control the strength of lights too. You can also use it uh, if you have different colors on these gradients, you could plug that into the emission color instead. If you wanted to make an effect uh, kind of like the lights on my microphone, where it, it kind of continually swaps and changes through all these different colors. Thanks for watching this video. As always, please remember to leave a like and subscribe if you found this helpful. Also, thank you to ASUS and Intel for sponsoring this video. Make sure you check out the link in the description.